All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Launch Over Lunch webinar, How to Deliver Hands-On Labs for Virtual Software Training. Next slide, please, Nate. Uh, before we jump in, just a few items I wanted to run through with you all. Um, first of all, as you probably noticed, the audio is muted, um, but you are welcome to ask questions, so feel free to ask them at any point during the webinar. You can use that. You can do that using the Q and A uh, section at the bottom of the uh, Zoom webinar. Also, we've got a couple of interactive polls sprinkled throughout the session today, so keep a lookout for those. And lastly, this session is currently being recorded, um, and we will also share the recording following the webinar. So, if you need to drop off early, or if you want to share with some of your colleagues, uh, you know, do not worry. We've, we've got it. We've got it getting uh, being recorded. And just real quickly, what is the Launch Over Lunch series? The Launch Over Lunch series is a series of live webcasts designed to provide both new and experienced learning professionals like yourselves with insights you need to get started fast. In these sessions, we'll roll up our sleeves and get down to business by sharing concrete insights that are valuable to you. Um, our most recent session covered how to build an open edX site in literally 30 minutes. So today's session is about virtual labs and how do you deliver labs within 30 minutes as well. All right, next slide. And just a quick bit about AppSembler, and then I'll, I'll pass the mic off to Nate. AppSembler is a modern platform for technical skills training. We streamline and simplify the delivery of online training so that you can focus on what truly matters, which is your learners. Uh, we have two flagship products. One is Tahoe, our SaaS uh, learning platform powered by Open edX. And it's, Open edX is an open source platform that serves 35 million plus learners. And our second flagship product is Virtual Labs, which provides learners with hands-on personalized labs so that they can learn by doing. Next slide. And here's just a, a couple of the customers that we serve today. Next slide, Nate. All right. And with that out of the way, let's kick off introductions. My name is Cesar Rufo, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at AppSembler. And I will be your MC today, as well as the moderator for questions. And the other face here with me today is Nate Ani. Hey guys, I'm Nate Ani. I'm the CEO and founder of AppSembler. It's really great to have uh, both some familiar faces, some of our customers are on the call, as well as a lot of newcomers. Uh, so welcome everybody. Great to see so many people here. Awesome, thanks Nate. Uh, let's see, next slide. And I think it's the agenda. I'll pass it off to you. All right, so in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, this is what we wanna cover. First, we're going to talk about why are we here? Uh, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, we're going to jump into what are virtual labs to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then the bulk of the, the meeting today is really going to be uh, showing you kind of behind the scenes, doing some hands-on um, demos of using the virtual labs software for both delivering training to more of a technical developer audience, as well as using virtual apps to deliver training to more end users, a non-technical audience. And then we'll have a time at the end for Q&A, but as Caesar said, don't hesitate to stop us at any time. Um, use the Q&A section on the webinar if you have any questions. All right, we've got two quick polls just to get a feel for the audience. I'm gonna hit the launch poll button now. If you all just take a quick few seconds to to submit your response for this poll. The question is, what type of training do you offer today? Uh, option one is developer training, product or software training, both, other, or none. Oh, this is interesting, Nate. Are you seeing these being submitted in real time as well? I'm not seeing them, no. Okay, well, you'll see the results shortly. Hmm. All right. Just another second. Looks like most of us are in. So I will hit share results. Nate, do you see the results here? I do. Wonderful. So it looks like the bulk of us here, uh, the most popular type of training that are, is being offered by audience is product or software training. And we see a handful of folks also selected both. 
Okay, so that tells me that <clears throat> we have developer training is also represented here, but people are only doing developer training if they're also doing product or software training. Absolutely. All right, so we have another poll and then we're gonna get into the demos. Okay, let's see. Second poll here. All right, the second poll question, and this one's actually multiple choice, folks. It's what do you use today to provide your learners with hands-on exercises? Your own cloud-based lab solution, uh, third-party cloud-based lab software, in-person labs are set up on learners' computers, dedicated physical in-person labs, simulated exercises, or none? Take a, a minute or two to, to fill these out. Okay, looks like we have the majority of folks have already submitted this. All right, I'll hit end poll and I will share the results. So it looks like the leading uh, selection here is your own cloud-based lab solution followed by simulated exercises and then third-party cloud-based lab software and actually also dedicated physical in-person labs. Oh, this is really interesting. We have, we have a very wide, diverse spread of solutions that people are using yeah. to deliver hands-on exercises. Um, but it sounds like most of you are rolling your own, have your own sort of homegrown solution that, uh, that is cloud-based, but it's not a third-party paid product that you're using, but something you developed yourself. Great. I'm going right. to hit stop and uh, take it away, Nate. <clears throat> All right. So um, before we get into the demos, I want to just talk about why are we here? Um, I always like to start with why. And, you know, most of you are learning professionals. You want a better way to engage with your learners. And as we all probably know at this point, the best way to learn a new skill uh, or a new technical competency is to learn by doing. Right? All the studies show that <clears throat> multiple choice questions really are not a good gauge of, you know, how well, oops, sorry how well uh, you actually have mastered a particular topic, but actually getting your hands on the software, on the development environment and doing, going through the exercises is the absolute best way. So what are some of the more traditional ways that learning professionals are providing learning by doing experiences? Well, one of them is physical labs and, you know, Traditionally, this, this has been the way we've had to do it. We've had to set up physical machines in a classroom type environment. And, you know, this is very costly to keep all these machines up to date. Um, sometimes you have to ship them to a location where the training is happening. And you need a physical space to store all this equipment. Um, and the other really big challenge with physical labs is that you have limits on how many people can actually fit in there. You have classroom sizes and you can maybe only fit 30 to 50 people inside a, a physical lab. So scheduling becomes an issue where, you know, there can only be so many people that can actually participate when you have a physical lab environment. So, you know, nowadays everyone has laptops they carry around with them. So you might think, well, we'll just, have everyone install the software on their own laptop and then we don't have to set up a physical lab. But the problem with this is that there's a very high setup overhead for the students themselves. They have to download some software. They have to figure out how to get it running on their machine. Maybe they have an old machine that's underpowered, doesn't have enough memory. Um, and in some cases they might not even be allowed to install that software. You know, many companies have a corporate policies around um, prohibiting employees to install you know, non vetted software on their laptops for security reasons or whatever. So even if you'd like them to install your software on their laptops, they, they might have a, a locked down laptop that prevents them from doing so. And then lastly, um, when the software is getting installed on each student's laptop, the instructors are really flying blind. You don't know, did they get it installed successfully? Where are they in the exercises? Um, it's really a black box. You have no idea how the student is doing in, 
in the course when, it, when everything is being installed on their private laptop. And then <clears throat> the other way that people historically have provided more hands-on um, exercises is by simulating what happens in a real world hands-on environment. And while simulations are useful and they're helpful, um, they really lack that, you know, dropping the student in the deep end and, and having them, you know, really working inside a real world environment. That's how they're going to learn. It's not working in kind of a, um, you know, sanitized environment. It's something where they can actually get their hands dirty. So what we'd like to talk about today are virtual labs and how they're different from these other solutions that I just showed. So what are virtual labs? Well, virtual labs provide learners with real world hands-on environments. And the advantages that they have is there's no IT department that has to be involved. There's no software that the student has to set up on their laptop, on their machine. All the student really needs is a browser and an internet connection. That's it. And as we've discussed earlier, providing these hands-on environments really leads to high engagement, right? Students can really get um, their hands dirty using the software, using the development environment in a way that they can't just going through a course, you know, with videos and, and multiple choice questions. Um, this is also called active learning, right? You're engaging parts of the student's brain that you don't, if you're just, if they're just passively watching the video and answering questions. And then as we mentioned before, with, you know, the challenges with the, the classroom environment, Using virtual labs, there's really no limit to how many students you can train because everything's happening in the cloud, right? And the cloud is infinitely scalable. So you can train 10 students, 100 students, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. It's, it's only limited by how many uh, servers that you can spin up to provide these lab environments. Uh, it's also scalable because you're not bound by time and space. You don't have the physical and time constraints that you have in a, in a classroom because you can basically deliver these labs on demand. With a click of a button, any student can get this lab environment. All right, so I'm gonna do some demos of, of what this looks like. Um, but before that, I wanna just give a little bit of precursor to what I'm gonna show. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna show how to do developer training. Um, it sounds like some of you are doing developer training, but all of you are doing some, some sort of product or software training. So the idea with developer training is that the entire development environment exists in the cloud. There's no local software that has to get installed on the, on the student's machine. The, the code editor, the, the terminal window, everything is, is in a web browser. And this is a great way to, to provide sort of hands-on coding exercises, right? It might be Python, it might be Node.js, it might be you know, R. Uh, you can give the students this developer, development environment in the cloud. And what you're seeing here is a split screen, right? So we have the code editor on the top and then we have the terminal on the bottom. The other type of training is end user training. And many of you are from software companies or you're serving companies that make software and training is a really big need, right? To make sure that your customers are adopting your products and they're being successful with it. So providing hands-on product training is a really common use case of, of virtual labs. Um, the other is customer onboarding. So how do you get people up to speed quickly with your product or your service? And then lastly, and this is, this is one of those use cases that we're seeing increasingly um, being adopted, which is sales enablement. So this is pre-sales. Uh, pre this is before your customer has actually bought your product. You can use virtual labs as a way to, to demonstrate the capabilities of your software product and if you're giving these training environments away uh, for free, it's also a great lead gen, right? So people come to your site, they enroll in a course, they start going through your, uh, your training and you're able to capture their email address and have a sales team reach out to them. Um, so we're seeing increasing use of using virtual labs as a sales enablement and lead gen tool. All right, All right. I just wanna be mindful of time, it's uh, 16. All right, thanks for the time check, see you there. All right, so now I'm just going to um, stop sharing my screen briefly so that I can switch windows, switching to demo mode here. Okay. Um,
All right. So the first, um, the first demo that I want to show, this is a customer of ours, Redis University. Um, they just launched, sorry, Redis Labs is the name of the customer. Redis University is the name of their, their online training program. And they just launched a course. It's freely available. Anyone can sign up and take it at um, university.redislabs.com. And they're making use of our virtual lab software to embed um, real-time hands-on lab environments for their learners. And I'm gonna, just gonna show you what this looks like from the student perspective. So I come into this course, I get to this section of the course and it says, you know, click to launch your Python workbench lab. So when I click on this button, literally within seconds, the student now has a lab environment that is unique to them. So this is their own personal sandbox. And I just clicked on that link, it opened up in a new tab. And as you saw in the slide earlier, I have this coding environment up here, right? I can edit um, Python code. And down here, I have a Linux terminal prompt. So literally within 10 seconds, the student was able to get a complete dev environment running. And now they can proceed with the exercises. So the first exercise, it's a very simple one, um, is, is basically to type redis-cli and then type db size. That's what the, the course is telling me to do. So if I do redis CLI, and I'm at now at the Redis prompt, and then I type DB size. Uh, what's returned is 14,677. So the course is now saying, well, what, what value does DB size command return? And I can say 14,687, submit it. And um, it looks like I just got logged out of my environment. Um, so I'm able to do that exercise and literally you know, within seconds, the student is able to get that dev environment and can do the exercises. So they didn't have to download Redis. They didn't have to install it on their laptop. Um, they were able to immediately hit the ground running and start doing these exercises. Okay, any questions there? Yeah, Ned, I've got a question here from Anjali and she asks, um, so it looks like what you're showing with that Redis Labs example is a MOOC style course. Mm -hmm. um, what about using labs for small style private courses? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have um, one of our customers is the University of Washington uh, continuing professional education program and they launched um, about six months ago a data science curriculum. And so they have students that are um, signing up for paid courses and it's a multi month course. And for this course, they wanted to be able to give every student their own Jupyter Notebook where they could do the exercises. And I'm not gonna show the UW site because it is a paid course and there's you know, student privacy. Um, you don't wanna show student data. But what I am gonna do is show a demo site where we have, um, we've set up a Jupyter Notebook. So <clears throat> if I jump into, this is just a demo site that I've set up. Um, again, I got to log in. And so as a student, I get to the section of the course where it tells me, okay, you need to get your Jupyter notebook where you can start doing your exercises. So if I click on this button again, as a student, it's returning a, a demo, uh, sorry, a lab environment for me. Um, this lab environment happens to have a password associated with it. So when I click on that link, it takes me to my lab and I now have um, I have an exercise in here. I can start immediately doing the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and this environment will stay running for as long as the, the course author has specified. So super easy for, for the student to get their Jupyter Notebook. They didn't have to download or install anything on their, on their laptop to get access to this environment. Any questions with that? It's easier muted. Sorry about that. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> um, so I've got a few <clears throat> questions here lined up. Uh, actually, so I'll, I'll cover them in, in sequence. So the first one is, how did the launch lab uh, button get into that course? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've shown this twice now where this, this button is showing up here. And you're probably wondering, OK, well, how did that button get in there? That doesn't show up in my OpenEdX site. 
So the way that we do this is in studio, this is the open edX studio um, content management system or CMS. And literally to, to add this button into the course, all the course author had to do is provide these three pieces of information. The first is the name of the lab and we call it a project. The project friendly name, this is what appears to the student. And then this project token, that's it. That's all the, the course author needs to know. They don't need to know Docker. They don't have to know containers. They don't have to understand virtual machines or how this works. All they have to do is just put these three bits of information in here and voila, they get this button, it's embedded. And that, you just do that from here, the, this advanced, you click container launcher and you just fill in this information. Um, so that's something that, you know, in, in other LMSs might take a lot of work to try to integrate the LMS with the lab environment. And we've made this, this glue, this connector between the LMS, which is open edX and the lab environment. So for the course author, it's, it's literally like, you know, a minute to add a lab into a course. And when the student clicks on that, they don't have to go register on another system and, you know, create a new account. We basically pass their, their information from open edX into that lab environment and they don't have to log in again and create an, create an account in that other environment. Great. Hey, hey Nate, I've got two questions. Um, sure. Actually a couple, uh, we've got two from Chris here. I think one from Chris. Um, the container launcher, is that a custom X block? It is. Yep. It's a, it's a custom X block that we've added to our, um, so we, we've created this X block. It's open source. It's up on GitHub. And the way that you add it into your course is you just go to the settings in your open edX site mm -hmm. and you just add launch container. That's it. That's all you have to do after it's been installed in your open edX environment, of course. Great. Thanks, Nate. And one more from Chris. He asks, has UW made the Jupyter Notebooks uh, linked to graded items? If I understand the question correctly, he's asking is, can the Jupyter Notebooks be graded? Sounds like that, yes. Yeah. But, uh, so, I'll, I'll wait for you. Correct. That's what Chris yeah. says. Yeah, so, so there, are, um, there are several different um, add-ons for Jupyter Notebooks that can facilitate the grading. There's one called NB Grader. And there's another one called OKPy. Um, those have not been uh, integrated in our virtual labs tool, um, but you could certainly create a Jupyter notebook environment that has the NB Grader add-on installed, and then the the instructors could use that to grade those assignments. Cool. Thanks, Nate. Um, we've got a few more, but I'll let you keep rolling, and I'll ask these ones other ones in a bit. Okay. So. I want to show a little bit what, what the workflow looks like for the, now you've seen how easy it is for the course author. What about for the lab author? What about the person who's actually creating these labs? How, how do they create these labs, right? So now I want to jump over to our lab, our labs environment so you can see what it looks like. So we've got this Jupyter clean lab. Let's make one that has actual some content in it. So if I jump over to, <clears throat> to get, make sure I'm in the right environment here. Um, okay, so this is our apps, our app similar virtual labs environment. And when I click on the images tab, it's showing me all the different images that are available for me to, um, to turn into labs for my students. So these are, you could, you could think of these as both base images that are clean and don't have any, any content in them, as well as images that we've, we've created ourselves that have actual, um, exercises or content. So this, the image that we're going to start with is this one password dash Jupiter. And so this is a clean sort of virgin environment doesn't have any, any content in it, but it, it has been curated with a lot of data science um, plugins and add ons. So it's, it's kind of ready to go to be used in a data science curriculum. So the first thing I want to do is, is click on the create container and I'm just going to make a clean container. I'm just going to call this uh, Jupiter um, cleaned and it has now created a new Jupyter cleaned and you can see it's running, it's pulsing that it's running. So if I click on this link, this is the URL that will take me to that Jupyter environment. And you'll notice that there's no content here, right? I have this work directory, but there's nothing in it. So I, as the lab author now want to create 
a Jupyter notebook that is ready for students to start using. And I'm just starting with a clean slate. There's nothing in here. So I click on the upload button and I have this exercise onepython notebook file. So I'm gonna click that, I'm gonna upload it. And you can see it's now here. I can open that up and I now have my, my exercises for my student all ready to go. Great, the lab author has now curated this environment, made it ready for, for student use. Now, how do I actually put that in my course? How do I snapshot that? So this is really where the power of our platform comes in because now what I can do is click on the save button. And now that's gonna create a snapshot of that environment that I just curated. So when I click on save as image, now I can type in uh, a new image name. Let's just call this, um, you know, for students, make it really clear. This is a Jupyter notebook for our students. And what it's gonna do now is it's gonna create a new image uh, that I can embed inside my course. And let's see, it did it. All right, so there we go, just took a second. All right, so now we have this Jupyter for students image. And this image could be used uh, for multiple labs. How do we create that lab? We click on this new project button. And this is where you specify how long you want this lab environment to run. So I'm just gonna give it the same name, Jupyter for students, and we'll have it run for one day. I could set a maximum number of uh, lab environments that I wanna spin up, but we'll just keep it the default for now. Okay, so now I have this, this new lab. Now I go back into my, um, my open edX environment and I can now add this uh, as a new lab. So I'm gonna hop over to, I've got too many tabs open. This one here. And I'm gonna add a new unit here. <clears throat> So what we're doing is we're essentially, this is what the, a typical workflow would look like. You, you launch a, a clean environment that doesn't have any content in it. You then add, um, you add your content, the exercise you want your students to do, and then you snapshot that image. And once the image has been snapshotted, it's ready for student use. I have to go grab, the last thing I need to grab is the, the token. Um, so we get that here. Okay, save that. All right, and then publish and all right, so this is our new, our new unit we just added. And as a student, when I click on this, I should get that new environment that has the IPython notebook that I as the course author just, just added. So, okay, again, we'll open that and there it is. So literally within, you know, three to five minutes, I as a, lab author was able to launch an image in, as a Docker container. I was able to add my, my IPython notebook. I was able to snapshot that image and add it into my open edX course. And it took me about five minutes to do that. So I don't, I don't have to know anything about Docker, about containers, about virtual JSON technology, about servers. I was literally able to go there and do that within five minutes um, all through the web, no command line, uh, necessary to do that. Any questions on that? Um, they just want to be mindful. It's already 30. Uh, I do have one question here from, looks like from Sam. And the question is, is this only for online courses or could it be used for instructor led training uh, in the classroom? That's a great question. Uh, 
I actually had an opportunity last week to, as we say, eat my own dog food. And I got a chance to use our, our software, our virtual lab software, to deliver training to around 30 participants at the annual OpenNX conference. And this was a really great opportunity for me to kind of see this in action, not, not for self-paced online courses, but for a, a real classroom type experience where we had students showing up with their laptops and we only had 90 minutes for the workshop. So I knew that OpenEdX is a quite complicated piece of software to get installed um, on your laptop. And we could consume maybe 30 minutes to an hour of the 90 minute time slot just getting the software running on everyone's machine. So what we were able to do with our virtual labs is we were able to create essentially a a development environment in the cloud that, that contains everything the student needs to start doing the exercises in the class. And again, all I had to do as the, as the, the uh, course author was add these three bits of information. And what it looks like to the student is, imagine everyone shows up at the classroom, they all sit down with their laptops and I tell them to go to this URL. They go to this URL, they click this button, and literally within 10 seconds, they have the development environment, they have the OpenEdX LMS, and they have the OpenEdX CMS ready to start doing the exercises in the class and how to get started doing OpenEdX development. So I won't go through all the exercises because we don't have time, but I'll show you kind of what that first student experience looks like. So again, they have the, the code editor up here and they have the terminal down here and they can open up, you know, they can browse through the, um, through the edX code repository and and edit files as needed. Um, you can just open up, you know, any one of these files. Let's just pick a random one, right? So I now have the Python editor here, and I can, I can save it, and I can run commands down here. Um, so this was something that was really a game changer for me. You know, doing I've done a lot of in-person, uh, you know, instructional led instructor led training. And this is the first time that I used our virtual labs product to actually deliver this kind of virtual labs experience um, to students that are sitting in a, in a classroom environment. And I have to say that it was just an amazing experience uh, for the students and for me as the instructor that we didn't have to waste valuable class time setting up everyone's laptop, but they could get this environment and hit the ground running and start doing exercises immediately. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. Hey, I've got a question here, Nate, from um, Mohammed, and he asks, um, it looks like everything you've shown so far, all the examples are for open edX. What if you're not using open edX? Is it possible to use labs uh, for your learners outside of open edX? Yeah, another great question. Yeah, so everything you've seen so far is all open edX related, but we have customers who are not using open edX, um, but still want to be able to take advantage of the power of the virtual labs software. So what we've, what we've built is a, what we call the event wizard. So if you're offering a, maybe it's a, a workshop or a tutorial or a developer summit or a conference, any kind of in-person event, and you want to be able to provide your learners with the same kind of on-demand lab environment, we've created this capability that you can create a new event and that event could take place in one day or two days or a week, it doesn't matter how long. And then you can add these different sessions. So here we have an event that's taking place in Europe. Um, this is obviously a fictional <laughs> event, 30 students. This is the Docker image that's gonna get spun up. And we have two sessions, one happening on February 20th at 1 p.m. It's gonna run for two hours and one on February 21st uh, at 10 a.m. that's gonna run for two hours. So what happens is when this time arrives, we will spin up 30 containers of Orion and make those containers sort of warm. They're warm started. They're all ready to go for the student. And the student does not have to go to an open edX site to claim that container. All they have to do is go to this learner dashboard. So from the learner dashboard, they enter their email address and it shows all the different sessions that are available to them and when they're starting. And if we were at this time, there would be a button right next to this session that says launch your lab. And all they would have to do is click that button and have the same experience that I just showed you from 
from the open edX environment. So this is, this is a way that you can create um, classroom style learning activities, uh, all still happening in the lab, but you don't have the dependency of open edX. Any questions on that? Awesome, thanks, Nate. Just wanna, just a heads up, it's 37, so we might wanna wrap up soon. And okay. we've also got a, a handful of questions from the audience that we'd love to cover. All right, well, let's, let's take a few questions now and then, I, then we can do the wrap up. Great, so we've got, um, <clears throat> well, so Daniel, Danielle asks, uh, can you talk more about setting up virtual labs for end user training on products slash software? All right, I forgot to show that one. Okay, so I do have an example of that. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is something called Open Refine, and it's, um, it's not really a, a development environment. It's more of an end user product um, for doing data cleanup. And many organizations um, have this problem where they get a lot of data, maybe it's you know, data entry or it's user contributed data, and then they have to take all that data and massage it and clean it up and, and get it normalized. So Open Refine is a free and open source product. And let's just say that you're a company that wants to offer training on Open Refine because you have a lot of messy data that you want to clean up. So you could offer this, um, this software as a lab. And again, when the student clicks on that link, they're, they're taken to this sandbox environment. This is their own sandbox. And then they could, they could start cleaning up their messy data. So I have this Excel spreadsheet. Um, it has a lot of really messy company information, product codes that have to get split. It's got all kinds of stuff. So using this tool, I can create a project and I as a non-technical user can start um, cleaning up my company's data. And you can provide training on how to do this. And this could be really any kind of software. This could be, um, you know, it could be a, a content management system. It could be data cleanup software, really anything that runs on Linux um, and it's web-based uh, can be spun up inside a, a Docker container. Great. Thanks, Nate. Uh, do you want to hit the wrap up slide and we'll just go fish into Q and A? Sure. Um, I think I need to, stop my screen share so I can share the rate. I'm loving these questions that are coming in. Yeah. Okay. All right. See my screen. Yep. Okay. All right. So to wrap up um, what we showed today that is that with the virtual labs, it's really easy for your students to get labs in the cloud. Literally within 10 seconds of clicking the button, they have a complete environment, whether it's a developer environment, you know, with a code editor and a terminal, or whether it's end user um, application. We also showed how easy it is for the course authors to embed these labs in their courses. They literally click that, you know, launch container, um, X block, they add those three pieces of information and the lab is immediately embedded in the course and it's ready for students to use. And then lastly, we showed how easy it is for anyone to create these labs from scratch. So they don't have to have any technical knowledge. They can essentially just spin up an instance of the clean environment, add their exercises um, in that environment, snapshot it, and then make those three bits of information available to the course author. All right. One more poll question. It is coming right up. And so if you're looking to launch your own virtual labs training solution, when would, would you be planning to do so? Just curious on the audience. Looks like we see a nice mix here. <clears throat> Let's give it another few seconds. All right. All right, so we've got a mix across the board. It looks like some folks are, st uh, the majority of folks are still exploring. Um, we're seeing some within three to nine months and uh, this is a pretty good mix so far. These are, we can't see the results. Oh, sorry. There it is, I'm sharing the results now. 
thanks for a reminder. All right, so it looks like the majority of you are still exploring, seeing what's possible. And then we have a few folks that are looking to implement it in the, in the very near future. Good stuff. All right, let's, uh, one more slide, mate, and I think let's start doing the Q&A. So um, let's see, we've got some questions. This, we've got an anonymous attendee, huh, interestingly. Uh, the question is, what platforms do you support for labs? You showed Jupyter and talked about Python Dev Labs. What else? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, it, it can really be anything that can run in a Linux environment. So it could be Ruby, Node.js, R, um, basically any, any software that can run in Linux, uh, we can spin up inside a Docker container. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. Uh, we've got a question, question here from Chris. Uh, he said, I would love to hear about how the projects slash lab environments can be linked to grade items and pass grade information to the LMS. Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that we've been um, really excited about exploring. The idea would be that after the student has completed the exercise, there would be some sort of um, call from the LMS to the lab environment to check to audit that environment to see did the student actually complete the exercise as was specified. And there's a number of different ways that we've been exploring how to do this. Um, we don't have a solution today, but it's something that we know would be super, super valuable, especially if you have a, a lot of students in your class and it can be very tedious to have to grade all those environments manually. Um, what we're doing right now is like you saw with the Redis example, they're asking the student to run a command in the lab environment. And the only way they would know the answer uh, to that question is if they had successfully completed that exercise. So that's, that's kind of a workaround right now until we can get the fully automated grading happening. Great. Thanks, Nate. Uh, we've got two questions from Brian. I'll just combine them. Uh, no problem, Chris. Uh, he asks, is there any way to see the machine that Linux is running on or just a terminal? Can I reboot it? I'm not sure what he means by the machine. I mean, you can, you can set these up so you can SSH into the machine and you can install software in it. Um, you basically have you know, access. Um, so, but we don't, we don't give you access to the host machine if, if that's what he's asking. Got it. Hopefully he'll respond back shortly. Um, I've got another question here from Danielle and she asked, how are virtual labs different from embedded iframes? Okay, um, so I'm not exactly sure what the content that's being displayed in the embedded iframe. Um, in the context of open edX, we are using an X block. Uh, so while you could embed the virtual labs launch widget as an iframe, the advantage of doing it as an X block is that we can send a lot more information back and forth with the virtual labs tool. So for example, when the student clicks on the button, um, in an iframe environment, they would probably have to, you know, enter a username or a password, or they would have to provide their email address or something. There would be an, some additional friction there for the student to get their lab environment. But doing it as an X block, it means that we can integrate directly with the virtual lab software. So the student doesn't have to go through another step to get their lab. We're we'll essentially passing on their email address from open edX to the lab environment to create a really seamless experience for the student. Great, thanks, Nate. Um, I've got a question here from Samuel and he asks, could it be made compatible with LTI? Yeah, thanks, Samuel, that's a great question. Um, actually, the, the UW customer that I mentioned before, they, in addition to using open edX, they also use Canvas. So they have kind of two LMSs that they use on campus. And so we've been talking with them about how to essentially take the same capabilities that we've built with our X block and turn that into an LTI component. So we absolutely see the value of making the virtual labs uh, embeddable inside other LMSs, not just open edX, um, by making open edX an LTI provider and, or sorry, the lab solution making an LTI provider and then being able to use an LTI consumer uh, in the LMS to pull in that, that launch button that you saw. Great. Um, maybe one or two more. Uh, this question, hey, Crystal, 
is can you use virtual labs for gamification? For example, custom content, incentives, et cetera. Yeah, so gamification is one of those kind of buzzwords that gets thrown around a lot. Um, so it really depends on what's, what's your desired outcome. What are you trying, what type of student experience are you trying to create? Uh, so you could certainly create a game that runs inside um, the Linux operating system and you could expose that game to your students uh, inside the virtual lab environment. Um, another way of interpreting this question could be gamifying the exercises themselves. So maybe you have a time limit and you have students that are sort of competing against each other to see who can finish the exercise the fastest and you have a leaderboard that shows, okay, so-and-so just got the exercise done first. Um, so those are, those are different types of ways that you could use the virtual labs to provide it like a gamification type experience. Great. Thanks, Nate. Um, well, uh, let's see. We've got one here from Jason and he says, he asks, um, could this be like, so I'm just trying to understand the virtual labs. Could this be for desktop software or does it have to be for web-based software? Yeah, so, so currently it's web-based only. Um, we have been exploring the capability of using something like Guacamole, which is like an HTML5 um, remote desktop type of application that you can install. And using that, we could, we could give each student a way to connect to a Windows-based environment, not just a, a web-based environment, but they could actually get access to a, a remote desktop. Um, but that, that's something that we don't have today. It's something we're looking into. Great, thanks. And I'll probably call this last question. And it's here from Amy and she asks, uh, why containers versus uh, VMs? I'm glad that question was asked because I actually have a little slide on this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, a lot of people you know, who've been doing virtual apps for a while have probably adopted virtual machines as the way that they, they deliver these lab environments for each student. And there's nothing wrong with virtual machines. They, you know, they work well. Um, the reason that we adopted containers is, is, is because it, we believe that it's a more efficient way of delivering these lab environments. So this diagram kind of shows, kind of explains how they're different. So on the left, you have virtualization. And with virtualization, every environment that you give to a student has a complete operating system sort of copied, right? Which which means that you have a lot of um, additional memory requirements. It can oftentimes take a lot longer to load that environment. Whereas with Docker containers, you have the host OS is being shared across all of the different containers that are running on the machine. So what this means is that you can spin up, you know, hundreds and hundreds of containers in the same um, virtual machine type environment. Whereas with a virtual machine, you would have to spin up, you know, you'd have to spin up a lot more virtual machines to give the same type of experience as you could with containers simply because they're more efficient. You can see that, you know, you can run multiple apps inside the same host OS. So we like it because it uses better, uh, it's more efficient with the resources and we like it because we can spin these things up very quickly and they're disposable, we can shut them down. Those are the, the two main differences for, for why we like containers versus virtual machines. Nice. Handy that you had that slide. <laughs> um, all right, guys, I think that's the last question we'll take today. We'll take for today. Uh, if you have any other additional questions, um, if we didn't cover it, feel free to, uh, to ping me directly or drop it in the chat and, and we'll make sure to cover it. Um, before we say goodbye, if you're interested in learning more about Assembler, I encourage you to send us a note or visit the links shown below. Uh, you can also get a live demo or try it out yourself. <laughs> Also, a quick heads up that our next launch over lunch webinar session is just around the corner on June 27th. Uh, and we'll be talking about how to author your for first open edX course and that'll feature members from our customer success team. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. We had a lot of fun and a special thanks to you, Nate, for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, please check your inboxes tomorrow for recording the webinar and until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.